Hello and welcome to the first video of Intro to Philosophy. And in this video, I'm just going to be asking a question, which maybe you've been asking, what is philosophy? What, what am I doing here? What's going on? Um, philosophy is a course that is generally not taught in high schools. So people coming in to college uh, for the first time generally don't have a very clear idea of what it is. Um, which is okay because a lot of philosophers don't have a very clear idea of what it is. This is kind of um, an odd field. Um, but a standard way of approaching it is to say that um, philosophy begins with philosophical questions. So your first exercise was ask actually just a list of questions that uh, I take to be philosophical and a bunch of other people do too. Um, and I asked you to check off the ones you've ever asked yourself, and ha there was a discussion forum about it. Um, in this video, I want to try and talk about what, um, what makes a philosophical question and then use that to introduce the main parts of this course. So to begin with, there's this fun game. Um, uh, called, uh, well, this is from the Wikipedia entry, Getting to Philosophy. This is a, um, it's, it's an interesting oddity about Wikipedia. If you click on the first link of the main text of any Wikipedia article and then repeat that process endlessly, you pretty much always wind up at the philosophy article. Um, uh, and for this to work, you have to ignore links in parentheses or italics, which don't count as the main text. Um, so I'm going to try this uh, right now, and then we'll, uh, I'll explain why this, is a, this happens and is, it is informative about philosophy. Okay, so we go to Wikipedia English, and when I do this in class, I usually just have people give me a word at random. But uh, since this is a video, we'll just click here from the featured article on Sirius. Um, which is the brightest star in the night sky. Um, so first link, brightest star. This is a list of stars um, shown by order of magnitude. Um, ma in astronomy, magnitude is the unitless measure of brightness. Astronomy, um, and again, we have to skip the stuff in parentheses, which is generally etymology or that sort of thing. Astronomy gets us to natural science. You can already see what's going on here, right? Um, we went from a, a, a physical object, a star, a, you know, a sun that's very far away, to um, a bit of uh, how that object is studied. And then, so we went from astronomy to science, which is more general, natural science, that is. Um, now we get branch, um, which takes us to branches of science. We ignore these and we go, we get to sciences. Um, systematic entry that builds, uh, you see, sometimes scientific method, empirical, information, uncertainty. We're already dealing with really big comment concepts. Epistemic. Philosophy. There we go. And we're there. Excellent. <laughs> so what the hell happened there? Well, the way Wikipedia is uh, written, um, the first wor the, the word that is your entry um, is defined in the first sentence. And it's generally defined in terms of something more general than it, right? So the first link in any Wikipedia article is to something that is more abstract than the thing that you're initially talking about, right? So you go from a star to astronomy in general, then astronomy in general to science in general, and you wander around a bit because sometimes there's an adjective before the next general category, like branch um, or uncertainty, but pretty, those aren't adjectives, but you know what I mean, a modifying phrase. Um, but pretty soon you just end up at the highest possible level of generality. 
And when you are studying things at the highest possible general level of generality, you're doing philosophy. This notion of philosophy as the field that operates at the highest level of generality is, I think, captured by this definition of philosophy from uh, a contemporary philosopher named Wilfred Sellers. He uh, taught at the University of Pittsburgh. He said, the aim of philosophy is to understand how things, in the broadest possible sense of the term, hang together in the broadest possible sense of the term. And that's, that's kind of clever and people like that. There's another definition that comes up, um, which I also like, which is probably less flattering. Um, and this is from another contemporary philosopher named David Hills. Uh, he says, philosophy is the ungainly attempt to tackle questions that come naturally to children using methods that come naturally to lawyers. Well, what's going on here? Um, so if you have had children or been around children, you know that it, they go through the why stage, right? Where they just ask why to everything. Um, and uh, child development people will say that this is really just because they want to keep you talking to them. Um, it's a bonding thing. But there's also this bottomless curiosity to it that um, I, uh, I, I think a lot of philosophers appreciate. Um, we, we just Philosophers are people who didn't give up saying why to everything. Um, but there's, there's the methods part. Philosophers typically are um, dedicated to rational methods. And as such, we use rational arguments that are the kinds of things that come naturally to lawyers. And in fact, um, getting a philosophy undergrad degree is good preparation for going to law school if that's what you want to do. Um, I don't know. I remember when my eldest was teeny tiny and she was going through her Y phase, so maybe two, um, she, I decided to just try to answer every Y question as best I could. And so there was a long strain of the, a string of them. Um, but the final question was leaf. Why leaf? She was holding up a leaf. Actually, at the time she said yeef. So it was, uh, why yeef? And I said, because of its leafy essence. And none of that makes any sense. But that's, that's the kind of weirdness that um, uh, endless why questions lead you to. And that's part of what philosophy is about. Okay. So I want to make another claim that's a bit uh, stronger. I want to say that philosophy is a natural human activity. Um, that is, this endless why questioning, this thinking at the highest possible level of abstraction. It's something that people tend to do naturally. So wherever people exist, you're going to find someone doing philosophy. They're going to be work um, working at a philosophical level of abstraction. Not everyone's going to do it. In fact, a lot of people are going to think that the people who do philosophy are nuts. But um, nevertheless, wherever you go, there will be someone who gets drawn into this way of thinking. Um, so that means philosophy is a global phenomenon. It's, it's a world th worldwide thing. Um, it gets handed down to us in terms of written and oral traditions from all over the world. And there is more philosophy in the world than we can possibly digest. So the first two philosophers I quoted were both contemporary white men. And I uh, do not want to leave you with the impression that that is what philosophy is all about. So in fact, this is going to be a uh, multicultural um, introduction to philosophy. Um, so specifically, we're looking at uh, China during the Warring States period, because we're studying Confucius. We're looking at ancient India, because we're going to be reading the Bhagavad Gita. We're looking at ancient Greece and studying Plato. And also we're going to be looking at, this map marks it as the United Kingdom, but uh, Scotland, really. We're going to be studying David Hume. 
And I guess, you know, he was born in Scotland. He mo lived most of his life in London. Um, so we're trying to capture a fair amount of the philosophy in the world. Now, when you talk about philosophy over this range of places and times, the, the question of what it is becomes uh, more, uh, gent more uh, comes up again. Because all of these places, people in all of these places, all of these different times have different ideas about what they were doing. Philosophy is a Greek word. So, the, um, so when we study Plato, we're going to be studying someone who called himself a philosopher. When we study Hume, we're also going to be studying someone who called himself a philosopher because um, Hume knew that Greek word. Um, in India and China, they have different words. It's a, those are different traditions. And with those come different conceptions of what's going on. Okay, one way we can think about how to bring them together, though, is to think about what kinds of questions tend to come up when you're operating at a really high level of generality. Right. So at the, for the opening exercise, I asked you, we, uh, I listed a bunch of philosophical questions and asked you which ones you had ever asked yourselves. Um, and these are questions that come up in all, all or most of the traditions that we, we look at. Um, and one way we can begin to bring them together is to start classifying these questions under headings. So there are lots of different ways people tend to classify the, the main divisions of philosophy, but I'm just going to give you three divisions that are typically thought to be really important. And this is epistemology, metaphysics, and ethics. Epistemology is the study of knowledge, what it is, and how to get it. So how do we know anything? What do we know? What does it mean to know something? Metaphysics does the same thing for existence. That is, what does it, what does it mean to exist anyway? Uh, what, what, what is existence? What has it? What, what is it? What kinds of things have it? And then finally, ethics is about rightness in behavior and action, character. So I mean, we can go back and look at the questions from the beginning of the first exercise and think about how they fit into these categories. For instance, the, the, an obvious philosophical question that gets asked everywhere all the time is, is there a God? And uh, this is fundamentally a metaphysical question. It's about what exists. Does God exist? Does it, is God responsible for all existence? That's metaphysics. How can I live a good life? That's the basic question of ethics, right? Um, what if I'm really wrong about something that's really important to me? You know, sometimes people have these lingering worries about what they think they know. And so you ask, well, how do I know that? And now you're doing epistemology, right? You're talking about what you know and how is it, how is it that you know it? What is time is a more obscure question, but sometimes people ask it. It's a bit of metaphysics. After a while, though, things get harder to classify. What is the point of having laws, economies? What's the point of a society? Well, often this just gets called social and political philosophy. We could lump it under ethics, maybe? I don't know. What if I'm dreaming right now? That is a question, again, of epistemology, because it's a skeptical question. Uh, what, do, how do I know what I think I know? Does it matter what other people think? Should I worry about what people think about me? That's an ethical question. Well, what, is it, what does it mean for other people to have preferences anyway? Well, now it's getting harder. Again, um, maybe this is metaphysics. Uh, why is there something rather than nothing? Metaphysics. Maybe? Yes. No, that one, actually, that one's pretty clear, actually. 
What is art? That's harder. After a while, these all get really hard. And then the very important question, do dogs know that they are good? Um, I, th I believe this brings up epistemology, ethics, and metaphysics. If we could understand um, this question, we could understand everything. Okay, so we've seen that some philosophical questions fit into these categories and others do not. We could try to define philosophy as asking the questions that fit into these categories, but already we see that would leave a lot of stuff out. And when we look at philosophy of cross cultures, we see that each culture will have, a, will, will have different questions that they in particular are interested in that aren't reflected in other cultures and wouldn't be considered philosophical or anything, uh, wouldn't be of interest to other cultures to other cultures. So I want to give you another idea of philosophy, and this is from Brian Van Norden, who is an American philosopher, but he works a lot in China, um, and he works explaining uh, Western philosophy to Chinese people and uh, Chinese philosophy to Western people. So he's well positioned to give a, a broad international definition of philosophy. In any case, um, he, in, in his book, Taking Back Philosophy, says, you know, you, over places and times, people have all sorts of different questions about what counts as, as, a, uh, as well, what we would call philosophy. People are asking all sorts of different questions, right? Um, and so he suggests a definition that, from our perspective, could bring together all the kinds of people that he wants to talk about. Um, and so I'm just going to read this quote from his book. Um, I am foolhardy, foolhardy, foolhardy enough to propose a definition of what philosophy is for us now. We are doing philosophy when we engage in dialogue about problems that are important to our culture, but we don't have agree on a method for solving them. So this is different than the philosophy's a level of abstraction definition, um, but I think it's helpful, um, certainly helpful for understanding uh, how people from ancient China, ancient India, and ancient Greece could all relate to each other. Um, it, it, it does tie back to the level of abstraction idea because whenever you deal with um, things at a really high level of abstraction, it is hard to know how to answer these questions. And that's why um, philosophers, uh, particularly in uh, the English-speaking world, rely on techniques that come naturally to lawyers. Uh, it's just the best we got. So... The thing that Van Norden here is talking about with the um, not having established methods for dealing with it is uh, it comes naturally with dealing with abstract, super abstract questions. And the other, um, the other part of it is that we're dealing with things that are, that the culture says is important. Um, and uh, that, that lends like the gravitas to philosophy and it um, uh, also, again, will take us back to things that are at a fair level of abstraction. But now we can start to bring in um, sort of the wide variety of concerns that philosophers have had that may not be considered um, philosophical now. So, for instance, for a lot of the history of European philosophy, understanding the rela relationship between the parts of the Christian Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, was really important. Um, but obviously that's not going to be important outside of a European context. Um, to take another example, uh, for Confucian philosophers, for Chinese philosophers, um, the proper way to show respect to your elders and your ancestors is going to be of incredible philosophical importance. Whereas in, you know, uh, uh, American, Anglo-American philosophy, actually how to break with the past, how to rebel against your parents is considered, if anything, a more important issue. Um, 
So yeah, it's um, this is another way of looking at it that I think will help. Um, but again, and the basic idea is dialogue about methodolo methodologically unsolved but important questions is Van Norden's idea. And that actually brings in one other thing that I wanted to emphasize, which is the idea of dialogue. All of the books we will be reading are framed as dialogues. They are conversations, imagined conversations between people on philosophical topics. And that's important for philosophy as well. Um, when you're dealing with issues that where it's hard to understand how to answer the questions, um, open discussion becomes important. Uh, and the idea that no one character, for instance, may have exclusive access to the answers or that sort of thing. Okay, so we are going to be talking, as I said, about um, philosophy from four places around the world. Um, and I just want to give you a bit more of a preview of that. So the first unit is on Confucius. So he lived from 551, approximately uh, BCE, that is, um, BC is the new abbreviation that used to be BC, um, so it's before the Common Era, um, about 500 years before then, in a uh, in what we now call uh, China, um, in a, uh, during a period that was called the Warring States period. We're going to be studying Plato and Socrates, also about 500 years before the beginning of the Common Era, um, but uh, well. He, Socrates died in 399, and Plato wrote in the subsequent uh, decades after his death. The Bhagavad Gita is a religious text, um, also from the period immediately before the beginning of the Common Era. It probably accumulated over time as part of an oral tradition, um, but uh, one that was already responding to written philosophy. Um, uh, again, sometime between the 2nd and uh, 5th centuries BCE. So all of that's from this early period. And then the one other thing that we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking, we're going to jump into the modern, closer to the modern era. And we're going to talk about David Hume, who lived in the 18th century um, in uh, Edinburgh and in London. Um, so this will bring us into the modern uh, more scientific era. And I think uh, one of the reasons I want to talk about this, want, want, want to include Hume, is to um, br not just talk about wisdom of ancient people, but also what uh, wisdom means in, uh, in, in a modern industrial scientific era. So this is Confucius. Um, uh, Confucius, the name Confucius, you may might recognize as kind of Latin. That's not his, what his name is in Chinese. His name in Chinese was Kongzhe, or which means Master Kong. So Kong is his family name. Um, his given name was Q, um, but no one calls him that. He, out of respect, you call him Master Kong, or sometimes just the Master. Um, so Kongzhe, or just Zhe. Um, he got, he's known as Confucius in the West because when European missionaries arrived in China, uh, it we're still at a point in European history where Latin was the standard language for educated people. And so anyone who did um, philosophy would, have, would Latinize their name. So if you're named John, you would write under the name Johannes. Um, European missionaries recognized immediately that what Confucius was doing was philosophy. So they Latinized his name the same way they would Latinize their own name um, uh, in, uh, to bring it into what was then the standard language of educated people in Europe, um, Latin. In any case, I want to continue to use the name Confucius because uh, that's what people are used to. Kongja is uh, going to be a more appropriate name, um, and the book will more or less constantly refer to him just as the master. 
I also want to give you a bit of a preview on how Confucius fits into the big categories of questions we've been looking at, epistemology, metaphysics, and ethics. Uh, and this will, all, all of this will become clear as you start in on, the, on reading the book. Um, Confucian epistemology is fundamentally pragmatic. Um, what we'll see again and again is that um, the proof of knowing is doing. If you know something, you can do it. And so when Confucius is working with his disciples, he um, will uh, say that he has succeeded when he can see them living life virtuously, living the lessons that he taught to them. Um, metaphysics is less of an explicit concern in the Analects. It's often, his I, metaphysical ideas are often just taken for granted. Um, but they're really strong and they're really important. Confucius was a religious thinker and he lived in a world that was infused with divinity. Um, he was basically theistic. The world had a divine order, a divine moral order. And your job as a human being is to play your role in the divine moral order. And then finally, Confucius's ethics are uh, what we call virtue ethics. Um, he's interested in what kind of uh, character you should have. Um, and his main uh, prescription, the main thing he want, asks people to do is just always be working on yourself to become a better person. And then everything else he does is talks about what it means to be a good person and how to work on yourself to be a better person. And this right here, is this in the screen? This is the book we're using. So this is a translation of Confucius's main work, uh, the Analects or the Luan Yu in Chinese. Um, and this is the translation by Edward Slingerland. Uh, it's a abbreviated, it's not the whole thing, it's just some selections. And so I want to talk a bit at the end of this video about how to use this book. So um, this book it, it, it has a lot of parts to it. The body of it is, if you can see here, um, just the individual sayings of Confucius. Uh, the Analects is composed of short comments or dialogues that were attributed to Confucius. Um, and they were initially part of an oral tradition and then only became later, became written down later. Um, so there were, for a long time, people were just repeating the sayings of Confucius as wise things that the master said, and it was just passed down orally. So the Analects themselves are short, and um, there's actually not much of the book that, um, well, it's, let's see if I can do this. It's just this middle part of the book here. In addition to that, um, there are centuries and centuries of traditional commentaries in Chinese on the Analects. And selections from that commentary is listed here in Appendix 1. Um, and so when you read the Analects, so the the commentary is all of this, right? And what, what uh, Slingerland has done here is he has, um, you know, he because he's a scholar, he knows the centuries of commentaries. Um, and then he has just selected some comments from other, from, from that history um, to help you understand um, each individual um, passage in the Analect. So when you read the book, um, read the Analects themselves. I, I'd like you to stay focused on the uh, uh, core material. Uh, but as you, reach e as you read each Analect, or maybe each book of the Analects, also go and look at the commentary in the first appendix. Okay, so those, those, that's the core of what I want you to look at. There is also a preface and an introduction which you should read, which will provide you with historical background. Um, Appendix four is the glossary, um, and that's pretty important because a lot of 
a, well, a standard way into Confucian thought is to under, come to understand the basic concepts that Confucius and his followers were working with. And I've got a shorter list than the full glossary of terms that I'd like you to, to, to come to understand during the course of this part of the semester. Um, and that's something you can download. It just says Confucian terms list. But information about those terms will be in here. Um, and then there are, uh, there's other factual stuff. So every time um, there is uh, the, whenever someone gives you a book in Chinese philosophy, for some reason the editors want to give you a list of all the dynasties of China. And that's just far too much for anyone to understand. But, you know, some historical background is important. So I'm asking you to learn the five dynasties uh, right, a, right a, around the immediate time of Confucius, just to understand the historical background. Um, and there's a list of disciples, there's a list of commentators, and all of these will be covered in subsequent um, handouts and PowerPoints. That is, I'm going to specify which ones I want you to know. All right, so that's it. Uh, the next step is to sit down and actually read the book and think about it. And as far as I'm concerned, that's the most fun part of this course. And so I hope you really enjoy it.